Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back um, to uh, Palestine Decolonial Series. I'd uh, like to welcome all those who are joining me from uh, various parts of the world. Uh, I know that uh, some people in Palestine are watching and uh, also from uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, as well as many across the United States and Europe. Uh, today I wanted to frame the uh, decolonial series uh, with a discussion specifically about the mandate. Uh, last time we spoke about the Balfour Declaration uh, and as being the first uh, public document uh, that placed the creation of a Jewish homeland uh, in Palestine, and that was the first piece uh, in a long process uh, that lasted from 1917 in terms of uh, the actual occupation of Palestine, and culminating with the actual declaration of the state on May 15, 1948. Uh, now, the mandate is a very important piece because uh, beginning in December 17th, uh, December 1917, uh, the British became the uh, effective uh, occupying power of Palestine. Uh, and for a short period of time, uh, they uh, transitioned from a military uh, uh, governing occupation into a civilian uh, administrative occupation. Uh, and in that process, uh, they facilitated uh, the formation and the creation of uh, a state uh, in relations to, uh, to Palestine. So in here, uh, what we need is to point to the shift uh, that takes place. Uh, the declaration itself was incorporated into the civilian administration. Uh, and this is very important and significant because the declaration itself uh, was previewed and centered on uh, transforming uh, Palestine's sovereignty uh, from the Palestinians who had uh, national aspirations and wanting to uh, claim a state of their own uh, into uh, creating a, uh, a Jewish national home with the Zionist movement being in the driver's seat toward that accomplishment. Uh, now, it, for sure, at the beginning of uh, 1918, there were definitely tension that developed between the Zionist movement on the one hand uh, and the British military authorities. Uh, the Zionists feeling triumphant, uh, knowing that also that part of the British army that was in Palestine was something called the Jewish Legion. Uh, these are... Uh, this is a legion, a British legion, that was organized on the basis of Jewish identity and was incorporated uh, into the British troops that arrived and was part of Palestine. And as such, the, from the inception of the British military uh, control of Palestine, you had a, a group within uh, the British forces uh, that came with the idea of uh, implementing and fulfilling the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. But immediately after the war, uh, the Zionists actually were calling for an immediate implementation of the Balfour Declaration, uh, wanting a state to be declared, uh, wanting to have the authority over Palestine, uh, also calling for the appointment of a, a Zionist mayor to Jerusalem, uh, and making other demands on the British military uh, occupying power. And from their perspective, uh, knowing that the Balfour Declaration has been issued and that Palestine, from a settler colonial uh, perspective, is their legitimate claim. So that machinery and that process was uh, unfolding immediately after the end of uh, World War I. Now, the British began the discussion of a mandate uh, early on uh, after the war. Uh, and I, I think what we need to understand is that the mandate authority or the mandate power is colonialism by other names. Uh, the notion that the Palestinian indigenous population needed to be trained how to rule itself uh, is an insult that any person with a sound logic would dismiss out of hand. 
but the British wanted at this point to engage in a structure that allows the colonialism to continue but under a new name and the new name or the new form that it took shape is the Mandate Authority. And the League of Nations granted uh, the Mandate Authority to the British uh, in order for them to uh, begin the process supposedly of uh, uh, transitioning in Palestine in a, sh in a period of time to a form of self-governance. However, the Belfort Declaration was incorporated into the mandate, uh, the British mandate, and more importantly that uh, the first uh, governor that was appointed, uh, the British uh, uh, High Governor for Palestine, uh, Herbert Samuel himself was committed to Zionism from the get-go and wanted to make sure that the incubation of Zionism and the incubation of creating a Jewish national home in Palestine will take shape. So when we think of the mandate, it has to be thought as part of a systematic process of creating and fulfilling uh, the Zionist aspiration for Palestine in the sense that in 1917 population figures, land ownership, military power, uh, social political configuration in Palestine prevented an immediate transition into creating a Jewish homeland or uh, in the conceptualization of Zionism itself a, a nation state uh, for the uh, Zionist in Palestine. So they needed a transition period that would facilitate a number of things. And I think in studying and looking at the mandate, uh, and I think we're going to cover a number of uh, parts in it, the following has to be understood. Uh, one, the mandate facilitated the immigration uh, of the Jewish population in, in Palestine. So from a 3 to 5 percent Jewish population uh, in 1917, the British mandate and the incubation of Zionism made it possible to move from a 3 to 5 percent uh, population in Palestine to almost 35 percent population by the end of uh, the mandate power. And the British facilitated this, trans this uh, immigration process with the intent of fulfilling their project of creating a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, now there is some research uh, there that describes the tension that develops between the British military forces and the Zionists in Palestine, and there are some accurate cases of that tension. But as far as decision-making, the British decision-making in London, uh, that there was no dissension or tension that occurred, and actually decision-makers in uh, uh, in Britain continued to be and continued to push for the fulfillment of uh, their promise and the development of a Jewish home homeland in Palestine. So one is again the facilitation of Jewish immigration to Palestine was an important part of this uh, incubation period that occurred under the British who actually were the custodians of the Zionist settler colonial project in Palestine. Second, from the early period, uh, as early as 1918, the Zionists were given the ability to have a political identity and a political uh, 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 formation. And a clear example of this, that the Zionists were allowed from the get-go to actually fly their flag and have a national representation for their aspirations. Palestinians, on the other hand, were prohibited from flying their own flag uh, that represented their aspirations and their desires. So what you have in here is the symbolic political representation and the symbolic national framing was allowed to the uh, Zionists who were coming as outsiders to Palestine while it was de denied to the Palestinians. In addition, in relation to the political representation, that the Zionists insisted that they, they would have uh, their own autonomy, uh, self-autonomy in relations to 
the British on the one hand as well as in the Arabs and for all intensive purposes the British military uh, authorities as well as the mandate authority dealt with the Zionist movement in Palestine as if it is a state within a state thus giving the possibility for Zionism to lay its nationalist uh, and state uh, roots in Palestine while simultaneously the British actually uh, frustrated, uh, tormented, uh, opposed, and derailed any attempt of the Palestinians to reach such a, uh, a, such a condition or to have that aspirations. An important aspect to this, as, to this notions of nationalist aspirations or representation uh, for the Palestinians, the British not only acted uh, to frustrate, but they actually engaged systematically in dividing the Palestinians. And I think anyone who dealt with uh, the early 20th century history of Palestine during the British mandate uh, will see that the British uh, divide and conquer uh, or divide and rule was pursued, uh, pursued against the Palestinians, dividing the different families and the aspirations of different Palestinian elites, pitting them against one another uh, in order to fragment the Palestinian body politic at the time uh, and then show favor to one group of Palestinians over the other in order to attain uh, from the British side the leverage uh, over the overall political decision-making capacity of the Palestinians. Uh, so much so that in the 1927 elections, uh, the British as well as uh, some uh, Zionist funding went into uh, supporting certain Palestinian candidates uh, in the 1927 elections in order to actually uh, neutralize those who have a different political outlook and vision for Palestine in, 19, uh, in the 1927. Uh, if that uh, sounds familiar to people in relation to the 2005-2006 elections, or some of the elections that takes place in some uh, Arab countries or Southern Hemisphere countries uh, in relations to divide and rule, uh, this is precisely uh, what the British uh, engaged in relations to the Palestinians with constantly putting the uh, power or uh, elevating and expanding the Zionist power uh, in Palestine, both in terms of population as well as in terms of a nationalist uh, project that they have adopted. Uh, now, it is uh, correct to say that in certain aspects of Palestinian civil uh, rights, uh, in relation to some uh, economic uh, rights uh, or some religious rights, the British were actually very uh, amenable in certain areas, especially in areas where they could actually interact and have an elite that would adopt the framing of the British. Uh, but this was all at the expense of the, nation, of the national identity and the political rights that would actually render the civil, economic rights uh, or religious rights almost to be mute relative to what is taking place in Palestine. This also gets us to the present context where many are offering that what we need is an economic peace or what we need is an economic investment in Palestine and if we do so then uh, we would resolve the conflict. Uh, a golden cage is still a cage, meaning Palestinian economic development, uh, while continuing to have a structure of occupation, a structure of dispossession, a settlement building, and uh, continue to expand the occupation footprint, will not render nor end uh, the circumstances that Palestinians find themselves in, which is, again, they're living in a, in a cage, even if this cage it becomes a golden cage, is still a cage that does that is the antithesis to freedom, uh, dignity, uh, and fairness relative to the Palestinians or any sense or measure of justice in this sense. So again, the second part is that the British enabled and empowered Zionist national aspirations of Palestine and constituting in, uh, to them or providing for them the platform to uh, be a, a effective political power or a state in the making within a state that is overseeing and nurturing their project. The third element, and I think it's important, is in relations to uh, economics and in particular uh, the uh, uh, ability or the facility that the British gave 
uh, to uh, the Zionists in Palestine to purchase land and to purchase land uh, both from absentee landowners as well as transferring some public land uh, that came under the uh, control of the British to be purchased. And this systematic purchasing of land uh, had very many consequences. And it's important to step back and to say uh, that at the early part of the 20th century, 80% uh, of the Palestinian population plus uh, were existing uh, as an agrarian society, agriculture-based society. Uh, many parts of Palestine also was engaged in sharecropping, and uh, it was predominantly an agricultural society with few uh, hubs of industrial production that processes uh, the agricultural uh, 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 products into finished products and I think there were a number of these centers that were connected to a broader village networks that were basically our uh, agriculture and agrarian society. So the purchase of land had many consequences and this purchasing of land allowed uh, the uh, dispossession of Palestinian fellahin, the peasants and this dispossession have a far-reaching consequences because it collapses the social structures that were founded uh, in those areas. It collapses the economic networks that have been formed over generations. It also put pressures on the industrial centers that were processing these uh, agricultural products, whether it's from the coastal areas or the mountains terrain and the valleys in the West Bank. All these uh, resulted in this fragmentation. More importantly, it's also pushed Palestinians, uh, fellahin, peasants from the land, and all of a sudden you have a displaced uh, labor force uh, that have historically engaged in sharecropping, that knew nothing other than agriculture, and now it sees itself dispossessed, witnessing its own land being taken by a colonial settler occupy occupying uh, uh, population, meaning the Zion settlers, and empowered by the British occupying force that is defending and protecting them in this sense. So economically, the British facilitated the purchase and transfer of land that displaced a large body of Palestinians, thus collapsing the agrarian agricultural economy that the Palestinians have existed over generation. And this coming immediately after the First World War, where Palestine itself uh, faced the devastation of the uh, First World War uh, impact. And on the heel of the First World War, we get a settler colonial project that is attempting to transfer land ownership uh, from the Palestinian uh, peasants and fellahin uh, into a new settler uh, society that was being... Uh, supported and incubated by the British. More important in relation to the economic dimension, that one has to say that uh, the uh, Zionists who came to Palestine uh, came from a, an industrialized societies, and there is nothing wrong with specif specifying the fact. Uh, Europe has already went through uh, industrialization, even Eastern Europe has went through industrialization, and the communist revolution that took place in uh, the Eastern Bloc or in Russia itself uh, had experienced uh, the Industrial Revolution and one can argue uh, that the revolution is part of the consequences or the impacts of the industrialization. Uh, and uh, we could reference that uh, some of the uh, development in relations to the labor force in Europe is directly connected to uh, the industrialization and the abuse that the labor force was facing. So the Zionists came into Palestine, they definitely are industrialized, they're far more advanced in the industrial sector, but aided by a, a, a British colonial occupation that wanted to transfer this land and the country to uh, the Zionist movement. So in this sense, it facilitated to the Zionists uh, to build their economic uh, projects in Palestine, facilitated uh, the importation of equipment, facilitated also the dumping on Arab markets in uh, Palestine, uh, finished products that also in terms of its uh, high quality was much higher quality because it was coming from an industrialized base versus the local uh, economy that is still agrarian. So what we have in here is a industrialized economy of 
the Zionists, uh, aided by a major power, a superpower at the time, Britain, is the effective uh, uh, colonial power in Palestine, being uh, pitted against an agrarian Palestinian society that has not experienced yet industrial revolution, and at the same time fighting for own, its own survival, its own representation, its own land, and its own sense of who it is at the end of the First World War and moving forward. So that economic factor has to be understood uh, coming on the heels of also the divide and conquer that the British were engaged in. So that's an important dimension. Uh, uh, the third dimension in terms of the economic empowerment uh, that was given and allowed and permitted to occur uh, by uh, the British, allowing the Zionists to have a leg up economically relative to the Palestinians, also granting to them concessions, uh, major economic concessions in Palestine. This does not mean that there wasn't tensions and the Palestinians did not as attempt to assert themselves. They did, but they did so based on fragmentation. Uh, the Palestinian uh, rivalries of major families, whether the families in Jerusalem or the families in Jabal, uh, Jabal Nablus or the families in the coastal areas. So these family rivalries that were ex exasperated, exacerbated by the British and intensified also made families strike their own deals to try to benefit from this economic, but on the expense of the political rights and the political agenda of the nation. So in here, individual family uh, benefits and individual narrow benefits took precedent over the uh, overall national project of the Palestinian. And I think the British were knew very well how to actually manipulate these relations at least they have been added for over 400 years of colonial discourse. So the Palestinians were not the exception, actually were the norm in how the internal rivalries were used to intensify the success of the settler colonial projects in Palestine. The fourth area that uh, to speak about in terms of the impact of uh, the British mandate is in terms of the militarization and the training uh, that the Zionist movement was able to attain uh, during the period of the mandate. Uh, I already mentioned in the first part of my talk uh, that the Jewish legion that was part of the British army in, in World War I and was deployed in Palestine was almost maintained intact and was incorporated into the structure of the forces uh, that constituted the mandate military power. So in this sense, what we have is an incubation of what later on becomes uh, the nucleus of the Israeli army. But it didn't stop there. It's also because the British have allowed autonomous governance for these uh, Zionist settlers and Zionist settlements. It's also with it allowed them to constitute their military uh, apparatus and military forces. Uh, so in essence, they were, from the get-go, able to acquire uh, military hardware, equipment, uh, training, uh, that was also facilitated by some of members of the Jewish Legion uh, that likewise seamlessly moved back and forth between the settlements and uh, the uh, mandate uh, forces, and as such incubated a force within a force, highly trained, and you add the dimension to it, again, the industrialization uh, played a role in this in relations to uh, putting together a military force uh, that was uh, cap uh, in made capable and empowered by a British uh, mandate authority that want to see to it uh, the empowerment of the Zionists over Palestine. So in, t in case after case, what we find is that these uh, structure of security forces and the structure of training, the importation of military hardware, created an army in preparation for the eventual creation of the state in 1948. On the opposite end, the Palestinians were prohibited from uh, developing any type of self-defense, prohibited from uh, acquiring any weapons. A Palestinian uh, caught with a knife as in the early 20s uh, during the mandate, would have been subject to six, year, six month in prison. A person with, uh, caught with a gun would be subject to a higher uh, level of 
uh, imprisonment on punishment, no, n no permission to allow for any type of collective security or training of security forces for uh, the Palestinians to secure their towns and cities. None of that took place. Palestinians were not allowed to import uh, their weapons. Again, if one accepts the notion that the British incorporated the Balfour Declaration into the mandate and they wanted to make part or sure that the creation of a state uh, is an ongoing project, the mandate incubated Zionism and made it possible for it to succeed. Uh, and the Zionists who uh, also were very effective both domestically in relations to Palestine but also uh, having an international dimension in relations to their presence in the UK in Britain at the time and then later on in the United States so they were actually able to leverage uh, their both international reach and their domestic engagement in Palestine to an effective incubation of a state in the waiting so by the time we get into 1947-48 that uh, all aspect all, all uh, parts of the state engine uh, was being actually uh, mobilized in order to declare a state in 1948. So what I want you to remember, and again today we're speaking about what are the key areas that the mandate have made it possible uh, to for the success of uh, Zionism and for creation of the state. Again, repeating those, one is allowing the immigration and incubating the immigration in order to transform Palestine from a five, from a three to six per, three to five percent Jewish population to almost 35 percent of the population providing a political standing in Palestine, uh, uh, a political national identity in Palestine for Zionism in such a way that it will be able to uh, present and make claims. It was an important aspect of it. Third, economics and allowing the acquisition of land, transferring of land and displacement of the Palestinians uh, to take place uh, in such a way that uh, the Palestinians will be essentially left without an economic uh, uh, foundation for their society and the creation and the causing of fragmentation and then uh, the military power and the allowing of the military power to be incubated uh, for the Zionists to have their own forces that begins during the uh, First World War the uh, 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 the uh, Jewish Legion that gets to be incorporated into the British mandate uh, military force and that begins to be the uh, nucleus for what eventually becomes uh, the Israeli army later on and that allows the training, the equipment, the, trans the uh, uh, trans uh, transfers of material uh, takes place. And I mentioned on the side that the British also utilize divide and conquer directed at the Palestinians to, to fragment the Palestinian body politic uh, and to essentially uh, cause uh, internal rivalries between families and elites to intensify uh, while at the same time actually uh, pushing forth with the implementation and the creation of a national uh, Jewish homeland in Palestine. So when we think of the British mandate we, could, we, think, we should think of it as the incubation period that facilitated the creation and the uh, fulfillment of the Balfour Declaration to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. So uh, this is part one of the mandate. I will still go into each of these areas to expand a little bit more, give concrete examples in the following parts in order for us to have a complete understanding because I think it's wrong for us to think that Palestine was occupied in 1948. Ocup Palestine came under direct occupation of the British December 1917 and we have been occupied now for almost a hundred years first by the British and now later on 48 onward uh, by the uh, uh, creation of uh, a, the Jewish homeland in Palestine came to be the state of Israel that expelled the Palestinians and then 67 another group of Palestinians get to be expelled so what we need is to say that the calamity that have faced Palestine is a hundred years and we need to understand each period of it including critiquing our own selves and what happened in terms of the Palestinian elites and the rivalries that possibly made it even much much more uh, much better or faster for uh, the success of the dispossession and uh, success of the settler colonial project in Palestine. So thank you for listening and look forward to seeing you again in our next chapter.